Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar today, where we will be speaking on best practices and upcoming features in Bing Shopping. Um, today, it's hosted by Bing and Hannapin Marketing. Presenting today, we first have Rachel Rogowin. Uh, Rachel, I will give you a minute to introduce yourself. Hi everybody, Rachel here from Bing Ads at Microsoft. Um, I'm part of the Bing Ads Academy team and our job here is to externally train all of our key partners, agencies, tool providers, and resellers about all of our products and tools here at Bing. Thanks for having me, Shannon. Thanks, Rachel. I will also be presenting. Uh, my name is Shannon Glass and I'm an account manager here at Hannapin Marketing. I've been here for almost three years now and I do write for our blog, uh, PPC Hero, but my Twitter handle is there if you would like to follow me. So a little bit about Hannibin. Um, we run the world's most popular PPC blog, PPC Hero, if you're not familiar, and our conference is HeroConf, which is actually happening next week in Los Angeles. Uh, so if you haven't um, heard about that, feel free to follow us on Twitter and see all the information and the happenings there. Um, Hannibin Marketing is an industry-leading digital marketing agency that manages and optimizes clients' paid search, paid social, and display programs. Um, and then a quick fun fact about us um, is that our first and second clients are still with us almost 12 years later. Wow, that's amazing. So a little bit, a little look into uh, who some of our clients are here at Hannibin. You can see them listed here. Um, on this slide, so we work with several big brands and Fortune 500 um, companies in a variety of verticals. So today, while we are presenting, feel free to join the conversation. Include the hashtag ThinkPPC in your Twitter tweets. And then, as a reminder, at the very end of the webinar, we will have a live Q&A. So feel free to throw in any questions that you have for uh, Rachel or myself, and we will answer them during the live Q&A. Before we get started, we do have a quick live poll question. So how long have you been in PPC? Uh, myself, I've just been in PPC about three years. Rachel, how long have you been in PPC? I have actually been in PPC 15 years, so pretty much since the start. Very cool. Awesome. So the poll is in. So the majority um, have been in PPC one to three years, uh, and there are a few who have been in PPC for longer than five years. So I think we have a little bit of everything today from, you know, beginner to advanced um, that we can share with you guys. Perfect. So I will pass it over to Rachel at this point where she'll talk about Bing Shopping Best Practices. Great. Thanks. So what we're going to focus on today, if you want to go to the next slide, Shannon, is we want to give you guys plenty of information to help you optimize and make sure that your feeds and campaigns and ads um, as it pertains to Bing Shopping are set up for success. We want to give you some hints about uh, reporting and some of the information that you can get there to better understand metrics and opportunities, and then share with you some recent releases in Bing Shopping so that you can take advantage of them if you're not already. So let's start with feed optimization. I'm sure there's many of you out there who say, I don't actually manage the feed, someone else does. And that's really common. Sometimes folks have a third party managing their feed. Sometimes you're getting the feed directly from the retailer and, and the team that manages that on the content side, or you may be an individual or team who manages the feed. Regardless of what you do to manage the feed, it's very important for everyone involved to care about the feed. So even if you don't manage it, it's, it's imperative that you understand what needs to be in the feed in order for your Bing Shopping campaign to be successful. If you have a poor feed, you will have a poor campaign. If you have a solid feed to begin with, you are much more likely to have a more successful campaign and account. So just some basics. We want to make sure that your product feed is accurate and you want to make sure that you're updating it at a 
pretty regular basis. If it goes beyond 30 days and you want to restart it, there can be a bit of a lag time um, to re-enable that. And then we want to make sure that you guys are utilizing high quality images, sales price column, and that you're really spending time on your title and description in particular to give us a lot of signals to understand what your products are about. And we're going to go into each of these more specifically throughout our session today. So some things to think about when it comes to feed optimization is custom labels, titles and descriptions, and categorization. So let's start with uh, custom labels. One thing to note, guys, with your feed, blanks are bad. Anytime you have a blank, it means it's a missed opportunity for information that you could be giving to us that could be helpful in us understanding what those products are and when it's most appropriate to serve your ad to user queries. So it's important for you guys to know that you should take advantage of every single column that makes sense for your business. On the next slide, we'll see required fields on the left hand, and that's the things that you have to include. But on the right hand side, we used to call these optional fields. We actually changed it and we to highly recommended fields because we don't want them to feel like a throwaway. These are things that are only going to help our system understand your products better, um, help you manage your account better. Um, so it's really going to be imperative that you guys not use these as optional fields, but include them across your feed. So when it comes to your feed, one of the things that can really limit your volume and how you're serving is actually feed errors. So some of the most common feed errors that we see is missing fields or um, if you have inaccurate information or the formatting is incorrect. Those are some of the most common things that happen with errors um, and why your feed might not be serving in its entirety. It's great to note um, that you can actually download this um, if we go to the next slide, Shannon, that even if you're not managing the feed, you have the freedom when once you're logged into your Bing Ads account to download your errors and to understand how much of the feed is serving and what are the reasons why it's not serving. So we have an example here of what this type of information might look like. So here, this person has a 97% publish rate. That's amazing. We want to see you guys up into the 90%. Um, obviously, the larger your feed, the more likely it is harder to maintain such a high number like that. But you'll notice that we're really granular into telling you exactly what you need to change in order to address that error. So I recommend that at least on a quarterly basis, if not on a monthly basis, that you pull down um, a report that shows you what your errors are so that you can have a conversation with whomever manages your feed to address those. Now, if you guys are managing large retailers, um, or if you yourself are a retailer, um, you will see most of the time that people set this up in a way where it's the product category, subcategory, it typically mimics what you guys have on your website. And from an organizational standpoint and understanding the products and where those products fall, that makes sense. But that's how, within each one of these, I'm sure that there are star performers and poor performers. And something called custom labels can help you to get a more specific view into understanding how these products are working for you. So custom labels are things like delineating which ones have the highest return on investment for you or which ones have the highest return rate. Um, which products have a higher low margin or that you want to push with a particular promotion or sale. What custom labels allow you to do is to utilize one to five of those custom labels 
so that when you put in those labels, you can decide how you want to bid differently against them, maybe even do a geo overlay to say, okay, these are our seasonal um, Mother's Day items. We're going to label them as such so that it makes it easier for us as we are managing our feed to promote those. Or if something is a, um, a winter type year, to only serve it to the states that get winter and get snow and things like that. You can also use custom labels to pull out particular products and put them in their own campaign and budget differently against them. It's also a great way if you wanted to monitor low inventory or things that are selling out, um, et cetera. On our next slide, we can see actually some of the most common ways people are using custom labels. You can choose whatever makes sense for you in your business, and you don't have to use all five. If it's only important for you guys to monitor two different aspects, then you just use two of the custom labels as opposed to all five. But this is going to be key to you as a marketer in delineating in, across these thousands of products what these products mean to you and how they can help you to manage to a stronger ROI. And then we have thinking about all the right words in all the right places. And this is really indicative to talking about the title. Now, the title serves two different purposes. On the back end, we use the title to help us determine what that product is about and when to match you. On the front end, users use that title to distinguish what your product is and whether or not they want to click through on that ad. So let's take a look at some titles in, in process here. So we have Guess Pink Cocktail Dress. So if you look down at the titles used for this, the first two really just tell us that it's a, a Guest Factory Girl dress. It doesn't really tell me as a user what, what about that dress. Um, the third and fourth one give us a little bit more. So the third one tells us it's a printed cutout sheath. The fourth one tells us that it's pink three-quarter. And then the last one calls it a guess 3778. So that tells me that that's probably what it's called on the back end of that retailer. That sounds more like a, a product label that you would use to say, this is pink dress 12345. Um, when you think about titles, you want to put the user first and think about what information you can put into the title. The same way you might think about a headline in text ad search is what can you bring that's going to draw attention and get someone to click through. Let's look at the next example. You want to also think about what is the terminology that users are looking for when they're describing your product. So you might call something the Rachel shoe, but if the Rachel shoe is a strappy sandal, it makes more sense for your title to be strappy blue sandal as opposed to the Rachel shoe because that doesn't have a lot of meaning for the user. Another place where we see this happening is we'll have, you know, on your end you'll call something a marigold shoe or a sea mist shoe. And that doesn't tell people exactly what color you're talking about. Um, our recommendation is also to use kind of, you know, the standard colors if you're going to use a color in your title as well because Folks who are reading it want to know if it's, if it's blue, if it's yellow, etc. So when it comes to looking at the title on the back end, this is where the biggest difference is between Bing shopping feed and a Google shopping feed in terms of what we look at to determine what your product is about. We look at Bing, we look at the title first and foremost and most importantly at the title. Meaning that you want to put as much information as possible into that title so that we understand what those products are and when to match you up to users. You'll notice at the bottom of the slide we have 35 characters. That's the maximum amount that can be shared externally in the ad but you can utilize up to 150 characters within the title of your shopping ad. 
So what you want to do with those remaining 115 is make sure that you're including some of these categories like brand, gender, size, color, etc. Now we know that this information is listed in other columns within your feed. You can actually concatenate and combine what the information that's in those columns and put them into your title. It doesn't have to be grammatically correct because only those first 35 characters are going to show. We want to make sure those are grammatically correct and helpful for a user. But the remaining characters, we recommend putting in as much information as possible um, so that we have a lot of relevant information from which to match you. So another thing to note when it comes to titles is here we have an example where we have five very different pendant lights. And you'll notice they also have five very different price points. Even though each of these is listed as an individual product ID, all of their titles are exactly the same. Because of this, we would look at this and say, oh, this is all the same product, and we would only serve one out of those five products. So sometimes I hear that people are like, hey, we love Bing Shopping, but we're not getting the volume that we expected to get. Titles is typically one of the big reasons for that. You want to make sure that your titles are unique to every single product. If we go to the next slide, having unique titles will allow you to have every product in your feed serve and hopefully the holy grail to serve multiple times within that Bing Shopping space. So here we see that a lovely sock retailer was able to have not only three different socks appear, but two different Star Wars socks, one Vader and one Boba Fett. Um, I know a lot about Star Wars right now in my life. Um, two different Star Wars socks where had they just used a generic title and said Star Wars socks as opposed to talking about Vader, etc., cetera, um, they would not have been able to multi-serve. And then lastly, when it comes to the feed, we want to make sure that you are utilizing our Bing taxonomy to categorize the products within your feed. We recommend that you try and do this at minimum three levels deep, but we recommend four and you can go even more. This is just giving us, again, more information to say, okay, this is a cocktail dress, this is a dress, this is clothing, and it, it actually goes left to right. So we'll look and we'll say, okay, it's apparel, clothing, dresses, cocktail dresses. And the more that you are utilizing this taxonomy and telling us what categories and subcategories your products belong to, the more likely you are to serve more um, and therefore get more clicks and hopefully conversions as well because we have a good idea of what those products are. All right, so now that we've finished talking about feeds, we're going to talk a little bit about creative optimization. And this is one of those areas where I often feel becomes a little bit of a throwaway when people are managing shopping campaigns. Typically, when you get an image, you get one image sent to you per product from the retailer site. It's usually that first initial view of that image. Um, and there's usually not a lot of back and forth or review to say, is this the best image possible for a shopping ad? So we're going to play a little game here. And what I want you guys to do is utilize the chat box. I want you to tell me, looking at just the images, don't worry about the title for now, don't worry about the price point or anything else, just looking at the images, which of these caught your ad first? Don't overthink it, answer right away. All right, Shannon, hit us with our next slide. So you guys can just type into the chat box which one catches your eye. There's no exact right answer. Um, I don't know that I'm seeing them. That's okay. 
I might have a wrong thing set here in my chat box. Typically, we see that um, people will say number four or number one or three because they're pretty shiny. Um, sometimes people say number six because the positioning of the shoes is a little bit different than the other ones on the page. The point being, even as something, no offense gentlemen on the line, as boring as a men's black shoe, there's still going to be ones that catch your attention more so than other ones. So let's do this one more time and see if you guys have some additional thoughts on the next set of images. So people usually say three um, because we see the bag on the individual or one because the uh, the rust colored brown is a color that pops a little bit more than the other ones on the screen. Um, again, we have a scenario where we have, you know, brown messenger bags and yet, you know, one in three definitely get many more eyeballs than the rest of the, on the page before you even get to that point to understand the price point and the title. And then let's look at this one more time. So everyone typically says number five because it's a red sweater and a sea of neutral sweaters. Sometimes people also say the, the white one as well, number six. Um, but the point being that color selection, the shininess, um, the visuals can make a big impact. So when you guys are running your shopping campaigns and getting visuals sent to you to include in that, it's important for you to think about how you can stand out. We can animate here. Um, oftentimes we even have it where there's the same image repeated in one single ad. So when that happens, you know, you're not really giving users much to go off of or to drive attention towards your ad specifically. So some things to think about within your ad to make it pop. Um, there's the image, price, and then enhancements. So when it comes to image, we recommend showing the image in multiple colors if it comes in multiple colors. This is a little bit different policy than um, Google Shopping, which I believe wants you to focus on a single color if someone types in, say, gray towel that you would only show gray towels. Um, from a user perspective, I think it's really helpful to know when something comes in multiple sizes or multiple colors. Um, it helps me understand in the case of towels, maybe I want a gray towel, but what's my accent color going to be on that towel? Or if I love a certain pair um, of shoes, does it come in multiple colors? Also when it comes to images is showing it in use. We saw earlier with the messenger bag that we were able to see the scale of the bag because a gentleman was wearing it. Um, particularly when it comes to things like bags, I always want to know would my laptop fit in that or wouldn't my laptop fit in it. So showing something in use can give people some of that scale. In this case, we see that the bottom left rug shows us what that rug looks like on the ground, while the other ones are kind of rectangles in the, in the sky. So understanding what something looks like in use can be really helpful for the user and help them to picture what that might look like, you know, if they were wearing it or if they had it in their home. So in addition to the colors and showing it in use, you want to make sure that you have as high as resolution as possible when it comes to your images. And especially in those cases where you see multiple folks utilizing the same photo, um, you'll be able to see whose is a little bit fuzzier than the other folks on the page. And you want to make sure that yours is the crispest because there's a perception, right? If somebody has kind of a fuzzy image or fuzzier than the rest, that can go on to say, oh, maybe that retailer or that manufacturer is not as, you know, is not as cool as the other folks on the page. 
So people ask me sometimes um, when it comes to images in particular, how would you actually test for this? My recommendation is that you can actually do, say, two weeks of one image and two weeks of another image and compare and contrast. I also recommend that you don't do this across the board, but you pick and choose a handful of products that you care about and see if there's a difference between them. I would also encourage you guys that if you're one of many retailers um, displaying a particular manufacturer's products, that you ask them, can I have a special image? Or next time you guys do photos, can I have an image that looks like this or, or something like that that's specific to us? Um, so that um, you differentiate from the other people on the page. Additionally, if you are a manufacturer who you're selling it through multiple channels and your own channel, you want to make sure that you as the official seller of that have a different and special image than the other people on the page. So just some food for thought as you guys think about um, the image part of a shopping campaign. All right, so then price point. Um, we have a few columns within the field where it says sales price column and start and end date of that sales price. So if you have anything that's marked down, I highly recommend utilizing those columns so that users can see a slash through on the original price and see the new and improved lower price. It's going to give you more real estate um, within the ad to have that strike through and then the new um, the new price point. And like I said, you can put a start and end date. So if it is a promotion that ends at a certain point, put it in the feed, then you don't have to worry about the wrong price point appearing at the wrong time. Also, if you see that you're not getting a ton of clicks or conversions on a product that's getting a lot of impressions, do a little sleuthing and look around to see what are the other price points that people are selling at similar to your product. Do some searches for those shopping ads. You can also do this kind of sleuthing process on the image size as well to just understand who's competing against you, what are they doing that's that's better or not as good as you, and how can you use some of that intel to help further stand out. And then there's enhancements. We recently launched Merchant Promotions, which allows you the opportunity to say um, more offers and have things like buy one, get one free, free shipping, 30% off a purchase of $50 or more, et cetera, and give peach people richer information um, about the offer that you have. That does not count as a click. So it's just going to further qualify users if they do look at that and then choose to click through that they have an expectation of what they're going to get on the other end. And then this is just showing a few things in action. Look at the images, look at the titles, look at how we have a few strike throughs on the price point. Think to yourself, what would you do as a user, which of these would you click on? And what would you do as a marketer to say improve one of these ads to make it stand out more against the other sneakers on this page? So that's it um, when it comes to creative optimization. I'm going to pass it over to Shannon to talk a little bit about what we call defensive strategy. Thanks, Rachel. In terms of defensive strategy, we really want to look at, you know, once the feed is in place and once we have, you know, everything set up um, in terms of the feed, how can we optimize these shopping campaigns and how do we create shopping campaigns in a way that it's going to be most beneficial and drive, you know, the highest um, RAS and so forth. So looking at key defensive strategies, as you know, in shopping campaigns, we don't target based on keywords. So we're targeting based on, you know, the descriptions within the feed. And so in terms of kind of optimizing, we have two options here. The first is by the use of negative keywords. And the second is camp campaign priority settings and how those campaigns are set up within your account to drive the best traffic. First, we're going to take a look at negative keywords. It's a very simple tactic tactic that's often overlooked um, in a lot of accounts. Um, you can use negative keywords to prevent products from showing in response to irrelevant search queries 
or search queries that just don't perform well. So let's take this first example here. Uh, looking here, someone has searched for gardening tools. The very first one there um, just so happens that it's not gardening tools and rather just regular, um, regular tools there. By taking the term gardening and adding that as a negative keyword, that first product would not have shown and therefore um, could have potentially saved the advertiser money just by simply adding in those negative keywords. Um, so by using ne negative keywords, there's three benefits to it. The first is just simply saving money. So ensuring that our ads are not showing whenever um, a irrelevant search query um, is populated. The second one is it allows us to direct traffic to specific products um, and other campaigns or ad groups um, based on the search queries that are being populated. And the last is it just really, really allows us to avoid irrelevant traffic and ensure that our products are showing only when the search query is relevant. The next thing we want to take a look at are campaign priority settings. There are three different priorities that we can use, low, medium, and high. Um, looking at these three different priority settings, um, there are various ways that we can use them. Um, for example, a low priority campaign may include all of the products within the feed and used as a catch-all. Um, looking at the medium and high, those are going to be the campaign priority settings that you want to use whenever you're focused on um, a specific um, segment of products or a specific group of products. Um, another example here is for in branded campaigns versus product specific campaigns um, could have different, pro different priorities based on the products that are within each of those campaigns. So we'll take a look at a couple examples and how we can set up um, different campaigns based on priority settings and why it really matters. So if we take a look at this first example, we have two campaigns here. The first campaign is sell items and the second campaign um, being jackets. Um, looking at the priority levels, they're both set to a priority of low. However, when looking at the bid, um, the bid on the sale item one is a dollar and the bid on the jacket campaign is two dollars. Looking at this one, the product within the jackets campaign is going to be the one to show. So with them both having the same priority, it's going to then look at the bid. So if campaign priority levels are equal, the campaign with the higher bid will be eligible for the auction. Looking at the second example here, you can see again the same two campaigns, sale items and jackets. The first priority level in the sale items campaign is set to high, while the priority level in the jackets campaign is set to low. In this instance, we're going to look at the priority level first, no matter what the bid is. So in this instance, the sale item, the product in the sale item campaign is going to show because the priority is high. So if campaigns have different priority levels, the priority not the bid, is going to determine which campaign is eligible to show. Here on the next slide, you can see a breakdown of different uh, common uses for the different priority levels. As mentioned a minute ago, the low priority level is typically used for catch-alls and ensuring that um, items, in, items in the feed are not being overlooked. The second medium priority is typically for normal day-to-day items um, and typically not seasonal items. Um, so everyday products, um, common products um, that typically will be shown all year round. And then looking at the high, um, high priority campaign, this is typically used for focus areas. So for example, um, seasonal items, sale items, products that you want to promote based on brand, style, um, or the time of year. For example, if you're a shoe company, um, a low priority campaign may contain all of the products. Um, however, looking at a medium, uh, medium and high priority campaigns may include um, shoes based on the time of the year. So in the winter, a high priority campaign may be boots, um, whereas in the summer, we're not going to see that same priority level there just due to the seasonality of the product. This next slide shows an example of how campaigns can be set up. So looking here on the left, you can see a low priority campaign includes all of the products. 
Um, on the right, you can see that a medium or high priority campaign can be broken out by a specific brand or a specific product type. And then from there, you can create product groups based on that information and go to a very granular, granular level, which we'll discuss in a little bit in terms of bidding. Um, so the first one here, or the second one here, you can see by brand, and then you can even break that out by product type or the various custom labels that Rachel mentioned earlier. Next, we're going to cover um, some kind of common mistakes in terms of bidding um, and how bidding is set up in shopping. Um, so in terms of common mistakes is that a lot of people use the same bid across the board no matter what the campaign priority level is. Uh, we see this as a mistake just because at that point the bids are going to be the same across all brands, styles, and products. However, we want to think of product groups as a way to organize products um, and really manage budget and bidding accordingly. Um, so Bing Shopping um, uses the product details from a feed catalog um, to match to the most relevant queries. And then at that point, um, it's going to take a look at the bids. Um, so if we have high priority campaigns, we want to ensure that the bid there is going to be higher than those, um, the low R RAS campaigns or the catch-all campaigns. The other area of bidding that really matters in terms of shopping is just the bid modifiers that can be put in place um, accordingly based on the various uh, areas that you see here on the screen. The first is setting bid adjustments for smartphones and a tablet audience. Um, so on Bing to reach mobile audiences, you can boost your mobile bids um, from negative 100% to positive 100% to reach those mobile specific users um, or to deter the mobile specific users. Um, another option here is that you can set bids in your everything else product groups lower than specific name groups. And this will help ensure that all traffic and data from products in the feed are sent to the last specific product and not the catch all. So you would use this in an instance where you're bidding on specific products, but whenever the feed is updated, additional products may be, um, may be included and you don't want to completely discount them, but at the same time, you've already set specific bids on other products. And then the very last one here is based on geographic, uh, geographic bid modifiers. Um, so to bid up high in high traffic, high value regions and bid down in low traffic, low value regions. For example, in the wintertime here in Indiana, a, a shoe company may want to bid higher on um, a boots campaign, whereas if you're in southern Texas, that may not be the case. Um, so users will not be likely to to purchase that item, so we may want to bid up here, whereas you may want to bid down in other regions. So next we're going to dive into reporting and insights and how to really take the data um, from within the interface and use that as a benefit to these shopping campaigns. The first table you see here is you can see the various product IDs and then we can see impressions, clicks, and the common metrics um, associated with each of those products. Um, however, impression share metrics are now available in the both reports and dimensions tabs as well. And this is where we can really um, start to see um, how we are compared to um, everyone else on within an auction and with on the search results page. So looking at share of, share of voice reporting, there are various ways that we can optimize based on the information from this report. The first one is impression share lost to budget. So seeing um, how often we did not show due to our budget being low within a particular campaign or even across the entire account. The next one is impression share lost to rank. So where were we compared to everyone else within the auction um, and how much does that have how much does our rank affect that um, in terms of where we're seeing and why we may not have shown up in an auction. The last two, looking at bench benchmark, bid, and click-through rate. So taking the average of the top four or five winners and seeing how we compare against that. This is really useful in terms of bidding if you want to ensure that you are above that benchmark bid and ensuring 
um, where you are within the search engine results page. And then the final one here is just looking at impression share and how many times overall your product showed on the search engine results um, page. And then it'll also give you uh, a very a clear depiction of where there's room for improvement in terms of bidding and optimizing your feed. Next, we're going to talk about um, how to make our shopping campaigns grow. And the one thing that we want to make you all aware of is that we cannot forget about remarketing. So within Bing Shopping, remarketing works too and is a great tactic in terms of pushing your shopping campaigns to that next level. So in terms of remarketing, there's five steps that need to be complete to get started with remarketing. The very first one is tagging your site with the universal event tag, which will begin, which will allow you to begin to gather information um, regarding the various op the various audiences that go to your site and so forth. The next is defining your audiences based on behavior or custom events to the site. For example, you can create an audience around users who visited the homepage, or you may want to create a, an audience around specifically around users who made it to the cart page but did not purchase. Um, so there are many different ways to define these audiences, but that would be the second step in terms of getting remarketing starting for shopping. The next is to take the list that you've created and add those, layer those on top of your current shopping campaigns. This is really beneficial in terms of seeing how much of the audience falls into each of the, each of the audiences that you have created. Step number four here is adjusting bids accordingly. So whenever you have a campaign and you have the various audiences layered into that campaign, you can adjust bids accordingly based on perfor performance. For example, if you have a shopping campaign um, that's targeting everyone and then you've layered on an audience of all users who have previously been to your site and you see that the ROAS is much greater than um, that of everyone else who has been or who has not been to your site, you can increase the bid there in order to um, ensure that whenever a user has been to your site, that your ad is put right in front of them. And then the final one here is just customizing promotional text, which Rachel touched on um, earlier, but just ensuring that the promotional text is speaking um, to the user that, the, that your product ad is shown for. So once you have tagged your website, um, it's really important to identify, segment, and target users based on the specific stage of the buying funnel. So creating audiences based on where a user is um, in their purchase path. For example, homepage users, those who have just simply been to your site, um, or targeting people who have visited specific category pages or product pages, or even the shopping cart. And then the final one here is actually targeting users who have made a purchase in the past and maybe targeting them with a product that is, is purchased along with something that they bought for before or so forth. And then the final thing is just in terms of merchant promotion. So displaying special offers on specific products or site-wide sales within product ads and really focusing on um, focusing on the offer that's placed in front of users. This allows us to really, really catch the attention of users and make our ads stand out in front of um, all of the other ads that are on the search results page. Perfect, so at this point, I will pass it back to Rachel to talk about some recent releases in terms of Bing shopping. Great. So um, the first recent release should actually help you guys um, on a day-to-day -day level. Um, we've actually included Bing Shopping now in our most recent update on Bing Ads Editor. This also includes our newly out there Bing Editor for um, Bing Ads Editor for both Mac and PC. So being able to manage kind of the campaign side of things when it comes to shopping within um, the tool has proved to be a big time saver for folks. 
Next, as uh, Shannon had mentioned, there's merchant promotions that we highly encourage you all to test out to kind of close the loop uh, when it comes to remarketing, but also with your general shopping campaigns as well. And then the last one is that you may have seen um, annotations start to appear across shopping campaigns. The first one we call the Elite Merchant Badge. This is something where we're looking at third parties who are evaluating the actual retailers and giving them, um, looking at their ratings and then determining if someone is quote unquote elite. If you are, if you do reach that criteria, um, you would get a little check mark, um, little red circle, hard to see here, but a little red check mark, um, verifying that you're part of this um, elite merchant group. Second, um, even if you guys are using the price drop um, within the feed, we're looking at a 60-day rolling average price point across your products. And if we see that a price has dropped beyond 15%, we'll actually put a downward arrow and then the percentage off that we see. Um, ideally, you want to be using both your sales price column as well as our annotation because that's just going to draw more and more attention to the fact that you um, have made your product more affordable. And then lastly, there's product ratings. Product ratings are on the individual products that you're offering. So we actually recommend that you can send us a feed with this information about the product um, rating across all of your products. We will also be utilizing third parties and kind of reading your pages, but to streamline that effort, um, definitely reach out to um, your Google or your, your reach out to your Bing Ads rep or reach out to um, our help center to help you get started with that process. Um, it'll go a lot quicker if you actually push the information to us. So in summary with everything that we've gone through today, we want to make sure that you guys really got a handle on the differences between Bing Shopping and Google Shopping so that you can customize your feed to really take advantage of our platform here at Bing. Um, on, in terms of things that you can do right here and now, check out the bid benchmark um, as Shannon reviewed in the reporting section and just get a good understanding of where you fall against your competitive set. Um, make sure you're checking your feed rejections to address any errors that might exist. Don't forget about using mobile bid modifiers and other modifiers to really maximize the return that you're getting across these different products. Think about priority settings so that you're telling us what part of the feed to look at first um, so that we're serving the, the products um, that matter most to you. Do an audit and take a look at your titles and make sure that they're really specific and that you're utilizing that 150 character space. Make sure that you have three to four levels of Bing taxonomy in terms of the categorization that you're giving us. Use those sales price columns and don't forget about remarketing and merchant promotions to just really help push folks down the funnel and get those conversions and those sales that you want. So now I'll pass it back to Shannon. Wonderful. Thanks, Rachel. We are getting ready for the live Q&A, so send over any last minute questions that you have. But first, we want to hear from you um, in terms of an account analysis and if that's something that you would be interested in. I, Hannapin offers a free custom account analysis for companies and brands that spend 15 k or more per month. Uh, one of the experts here at Hannapin will look in your account and compare the structure and results to industry standards. Um, it's something that I would highly recommend for in-house PPC teams, especially because it gets a fresh set of eyes on your account and you can really walk away some, with some great takeaways. Perfect. So now we are going to launch into the Q&A where we have a few questions that have already came through. The first question, where do you find the information to review rejections to ensure full coverage? This is referring to slide 17. So if you're currently running um, a Bing Ads campaign within the UI, um, you want to actually go to, hold on one moment here, um, 
you want to go to catalog management and within catalog management it's going to list your catalog which is basically your feed name your overall feed name and then there's a little column that says status and next to it it says view errors and when you click on that it takes you to a page where you can view your errors and download them perfect thanks Rachel no problem we have another question um, in terms of are the feeds the same between Google and Bing, and what makes them different? So in general, um, this is Rachel again, the feeds are the same, meaning that you can take your Google feed, upload it into Bing, and be running Bing shopping campaigns. The differences, um, the differences in terms of columns and things like that, there's only one difference. It's that Google requires taxes and shipping fees as a column within your feed. We actually ask you for taxes and shipping feeds in the Merchant Center and this is only applicable if you are running in Germany because Germany has rules about including taxes and shipping fees within the shopping campaigns. So that'll be the only difference that you'll see in terms of say columns within the two different feeds. I guess the overarching difference though is not necessarily about one feed versus the other feed but kind of how our how our system looks at your feed. So like I say, Google's looking at those columns such as brand, size, et cetera, and taking most of their signals from there. We're taking most of our signals um, from the title followed by the description. So I think it's just a matter of spending more time to make sure that your titles and descriptions are robust, both from a front end user perspective as well as a back end perspective for us. Um, that would be one of the, the most major changes that I think you would need to do in order to run um, shopping campaigns and have kind of full breadth of your product feed to serve. Wonderful. Thanks again, Rachel. No problem. And then we do have one final question here. Um, if there are any other questions um, out there, feel free to send those over. Um, but the final question is, if things have the same priority level and the same CPC, what products are we going to serve and what is taking into consideration? So if you have two different, so let's go back to the example that you talked about, Shannon, where we have jackets that are also, that individual, say, blue jacket is also on sale and it's in the sale campaign and it's also in the jackets campaign. If both of those say were on um, medium level um, and had the same exact CPC and the same exact information, we would probably just look at whichever one showed up in the feed first. Um, so you, um, but if there are slight differences between what you put in those columns, so maybe it's the same Maybe it's the same exact um, same exact product, but the titles are slightly different or anything like that. We would then look at the signals within the titles and the descriptions and the columns and the and the setup. And if there was differences between those, we would look at the one that we felt was um, that was cl most closely related to the query of what someone was looking for. Perfect. So going back to ensuring that your feed is optimized for the best um, best performance there and ensuring that your descriptions are um, really clear there and very unique to each product. Yep. Wonderful. So that's all the questions that we had today. Thank you for attending our webinar and feel free to um, tweet at us at ThinkPPC. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.